is doing in, on behalf of the students and how he's moving through them and their hunger and their thirst for God and his righteousness is just amazing. And I haven't been here that long, but to already see it displayed in the students is such a blessing. And to see them own the ministry is also such a blessing. So we had a couple of presentations um, today for the youth and we have Robert here today. Um, so maybe next month we'll have a few more youth. So what Robert is uh, here to share with you is a, a scripture that he's going to, that I asked him to pick a scripture that really speaks to him and um, he did and he's going to speak on it for about a couple, few minutes and also share with you a poem. And I'm excited to see what the Lord is doing. Amen. Amen. So I present to you Robert. Um, the verse I chose to speak about was Timothy 4.12. Uh, it states, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct in love and faith and theory. Um, from there, I found a poem that I would really like to share and then I'll continue on. Um, don't despise me because I'm young and even though I am unsung, I can still work for my Lord even if I'm ignored. I shall do my part and spread love from my heart. I can set an example for believers in every way, from what I have, from what I live to what I do and say. I can show how to be pure. I can show how to endure. I can show how to believe even when we grieve. So don't look down on me because I'm young and free, and do not know what I can become. For it is from God I have come. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, the verse really, uh, it shows just how important, important it is for all believers of whatever age to get up and um, show how faith can move through them. Oftentimes, we as Christians, we will just say something, but we won't actually show it through action. And only through action can we really spread our faith. And... Uh, I think that's what it was trying to say. That's what it spoke to me what about when I read it a few nights ago. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Can we give him another round of applause? That's, you know, if... I was his age and somebody told me to go up in front of a church and speak at, on a verse and then do a poem, I'd be like, no. Okay, so thank you so much, Robert. We actually had another presentation, but she was on, she's unable to do something to me when I see the youth worship God, you know, because I go to churches and I've seen adults afraid to lift their hands and worship God. So it's something when you see the youth do it. Amen. 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 Praise God. Um, can we stand for the reading of the word? We're going to be coming from 2 Kings 13, verse 20 and 21. When you have it, say have it. <laughs> oh, it's on there, so everybody has it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> okay, amen. Verse 20 reads, And Elisha died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. 
When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to say thank you. Thank you, Father God, for what you're doing in our life. Thank you for how you're moving in our life. Thank you for the purpose that we have over our lives. Father God, I ask, Father God, that your word that is being said today, Father God, does not fall on deaf ears. Father God, we ask that we bind up every distraction, Father God. And we thank you that the word is being received with a readiness of heart. And we thank you right now, Father, for all that you're doing unto today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated amen. in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I am a very uh, mobile speaker, so I move. So I, I apologize ahead of time. But I really, really want to go over the characteristics of a believer because it's imperative and it's important that we understand who we are in the body of Christ. Now, when we look at this scripture, we talk about characteristics. I mean, I just read it and you're probably wondering, I don't see any characteristics of a believer. Actually, there, there are three that we're going to pinpoint today. And the point of this, this teaching is to create a hunger and a thirst for you and to you guys, when you go home after this study, that you want to read more about Elisha. Okay? All right. So let's talk about this scripture. They were burying a dead man. And some Moabites were coming into the land while this burial was happening. And so the people that were burying this man got scared. And what they did is they tossed this dead man. They just threw him to the side and they ran for their lives. When they threw him to the side, this dead man landed inside the tomb of Elisha. And when that dead man hit Elisha's bones, that dead man stood up. So my question for you today is what are you doing? How many people have crossed your path that are depressed, that are oppressed, that have no hope? How are you reviving them? Are they leaving your presence the same way they came? Because as a believer, we are called to bring light into any situation. We are called to bring light into the darkness. But what happens is, we get so caught up in the world that our carnality dims that light that we've been commissioned to shine. All right. So we have to make a conscious effort and a conscious decision that our job as a believer is to revive the lost. It's to comfort those who need comfort. It's to provide hope for those who need hope. How many people do you know daily, I was looking at the, the, the statistics, that commit suicide every day? There's, there's hundreds of people daily who decide to take their own life because they have no hope. Us as believers, we are commissioned to bring them hope, bring them Christ. Some of them have never heard of Jesus, so they don't know what hope looks like. They've been tossed aside. They've been cast out of society. And what happens with us? We get so consumed with our own selves. We get so consumed in our own problems. All right. How many people have passed you? Whether you're in the store, whether you're at uh, work, taking your kids to school, your grandkids to school. They've passed you. God entrusted these people and they've passed your presence and you don't know how they've been. You don't know how they are. There was a time when you were deep in your mess. There was a time when you were stuck in your mess. And the Lord raised somebody up to come and deliver you. To come and speak a word to you. That's the same word we are required and commissioned to, to bring hope to people. Amen? So we're going to examine quickly because I won't be before you long. We will examine briefly the life of Elisha. And how Elisha was even used after his death. You're alive, what are you doing? What are you doing for the body of Christ? What are you doing for the kingdom of God? Are you so in tune with your own self that you can't pray for your brother or sister? You know what happens is when somebody asks us for prayer, we say, okay, I'll pray for you and keep going what we have to do. We have to be intentional in this walk. We have to be intentional that if somebody needs prayer, hey, I'm putting whatever I got to put on hold because my brother and my sister, they matter. Yeah. I, can, I can put what I have to put on hold. We talk about the, the, um, the Good Samaritan when he was on, his, when he was on the way. He, we, we don't stop to realize that he was on the way somewhere. Yeah. And he stopped. And he took care of his brother. 
And he spent the night with his brother and patched up his wounds. And then he went to the inn and gave him extra money and said, hey, if my brother, if he overspends, call me and I'll come back and pay the debt. That is a true believer. What are you doing for the body of Christ? Are you so consumed with your own problems that you can't help your brother or your sister? You can't revive them. You can't bring them back to life. There has to be a shift. There has to be a change. That's what happens when you come across the life of a believer. There's a shift that happens. There's a change. And, and we'll talk about it in the scripture. The word says that the man stood up. He arose. In Hebrew, that arose word is kum. And we see it in Jonah. And kum means to arise to a higher spiritual level. So not only did this man stand up when he hit the bones of Elisha, he rose to a higher spiritual level. That means that his mentality wasn't the same when he stood up. That means that he was not the same, he was not the same person as he was before. So then now let's talk about you. When people come into your presence and their hope is gone. There should be a shift. People should leave your presence in a higher state. Their mental state should be higher. They should be changed. That's what the gospel does. That's what God does to you. God does to us. He cleans us up. He gives us hope. Amen? All right, let's study Elisha briefly because I won't be before you long. So we're going to study Elisha. And, and for you who may not be familiar with Elisha, there's Elijah and there's Elisha. And I don't want to confuse you. So we're, really, we're strictly going to stick to Elisha, but I want to give you a brief synopsis of Elijah. So Elijah was a prophet. And he was a prophet during the reign of Ahab. And Elijah, he's the one that caught fire down from heaven. Elijah is the one that stopped rain for three and a half years. Elijah is the one that outran a chariot for many miles with King Ahab in it on the way to Samaria. So we can understand what kind of man of God Elijah was. He was dedicated to the Lord. He was faithful to the Lord. Okay? So Elijah was running from Jezebel because Jezebel had made life-threatening threats to Elijah. So Elijah ran to Jezebel, uh, ran from Jezebel, and he ended up in the wilderness. And so when he's in this wilderness, he basically prays to God and he says, I'm doing everything you want me to do, Lord. I, I went and stood before Jezebel and told her that she was wrong. And now they're, 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 they're want, they want to kill me. I'm paraphrasing for you. Though this is not scripture that I'm just telling you, okay? I'm paraphrasing. And so, and so what happens is he goes into the wilderness and then the Lord encourages him. How many of us are sensitive enough to the spirit or we can pay attention to when the Lord encourages us? We often shrug that encouragement off as, ah, it's nothing. Let's be sensitive to the spirit like Elijah was. He was sensitive. So the Lord encouraged him. How did the Lord encourage him? The Lord sent an angel to bake him a cake. There was a cake when he arose and then there was water. Talk about the Lord. And so when he encouraged Eliza, that gave him strength. And so the Lord told him, I want you to go to the mount. Because before you're done with the excitement, I need you to anoint three people. So the three people that the Lord had Elijah anoint was Hazael, which was a king, was, was Nimshi, and was Elisha. So the, the scripture says that after he left the mount, that he went and found Elisha. So now we're going to get into the points in the life of Elisha. There's three points that I want to cover today. The first point is that when Elijah, when Elijah found Elisha, he was working. Elisha was working. He was plowing 12 oxen. Sometimes we want to be called to a higher sense of ministry when we can't even take care of what God has given us today. Okay? Elisha was found working, plowing the oxen. Elisha was the son of a wealthy man. So Elisha really didn't have to plow the oxen, but he was working as he was working unto the Lord. Amen. We sometimes get so stuck in our secular jobs. Oh Lord, when are you going to promote me? Oh Lord, when am I going to get moved up higher? And he's like, you're not even doing what I've what, what I given you. You're not even being faithful in the little that I gave you. You want me to entrust you to more? 
Elisha was found being productive. What is your productivity like? How are you working? The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 19 that he that tills the land will reap plenty of bread. Basically saying if you work, there's a reward for your working. In the Bible, the word says that the God told Adam to work. In Hebrew, that work needs to become. What are you becoming? Okay? Productivity. Let's talk about that. The Bible says that the mantle that Elijah had, when he found Elisha working, he threw it on Elisha. A mantle. In that custom, a mantle was made of animal hair. And a mantle was only worn by the priests and the kings. And what a mantle was, was it was symbolic to the owner's calling, it was symbolic to the owner's authority, and it was symbolic to the owner's position. So what Elijah was doing was he was casting his authority on Elisha. He was casting his position on Elisha. He was casting his calling on Elisha. Now let's talk about humility. Because when Elisha received that, he didn't say, okay, now the Lord anointed me, now you go do what I got to do, now I'm, now, I'm, now I'm the speaker, now I'm going to speak to 5,000 people, now Now you're going to pay me $5,000 to speak because the Lord called me to speak. How many of us do that? How many do we see televangelists charging thousands of dollars to speak the word of God? Uh -huh. Let's talk about humility. Who are you submitted to? Who are you under? Elisha was submitted to Elijah. Even though the calling, his authority, his position was placed on Elisha, he was still submitted to this man of God because he wanted to glean. He wanted to learn everything that he could learn about the Lord. How much are you hungering and thirsting for the word of God? Yes. That you can sit under somebody yes. and learn. Who are you submitted to? Who is accounted for you? There is hierarchy in the body of Christ. 1 First, First Corinthians 14.40 says... That there's order. There's order in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten so commissioned where we're out of order, where the, the kingdom of darkness has more order than the body of Christ. There's hierarchy. Come on. So his mantle was placed on him. So when he got the when he got the calling, when the mantle was placed on him, the Bible says that Elisha ran after Elijah. He recognized that that anointing, he recognized the calling, he recognized the position, and he ran after Elijah. And when he caught up to Elijah, what does the scripture say? The scripture says that Elisha told Elijah this. He said, can I go back and kiss my mother and kiss my father? Because he recognized what he had to do. Let's talk about this, the counting the cost of discipleship. Luke 14 talks about Jesus. Jesus says, how many of you guys would build a tower without counting the cost? Where you lay the foundation and then you realize you ran out of money and you don't have enough to finish it? That is counting the cost of discipleship. What happens with us as Christians? We think, oh yeah, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go to, to, to be in ministry. But you haven't got the world out of you yet. You haven't counted the cost. You don't recognize that being uh, in ministry, there's a call to consecration. So while your friends are going out, having fun, hanging out, God may call you to prayer. God may call you to be separate and you have to be okay with that because that's the call to ministry. He says beforehand, before you jump with any zeal to respond to the calling that I've placed on you, count the cost. Because there's a cost to following me. Yeah. The cost is uncomfortability. Christians, Christianity, we have a book of promises, not a book of comfort. We are not designed to be comfort in this walk, comfortable in this walk. You are going to do some things, the Lord is going to have you do some things that are not, you aren't familiar with. Elisha had to leave the unfamiliar, he had to leave the familiar to get where he was going to. A lot of you guys aren't elevating because you are stuck in the same place. God is trying to call you out and you are trying to stay in. There's a cost of discipleship. You have to count it. Okay, I know the Lord, I know following the Lord is going to cause me to, to have to lose some friends or, or maybe I can't do this when I want to. Let's talk about ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We call the Lord, 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 and don't even realize what we're calling him. Lord, 
And the Hebrew means owner. But when we profess the Lord is our Lord and we do everything that we want to do, you are not living like you have an owner. When you say, I'm going to go do this and then I'm going to go do this and then you invite the Lord into your plan instead of saying, Lord, what do you have for me to do today? Mm-hmm. You're not living like you have an owner. Come on. Your owner is yourself. Okay, Elisha left what he was familiar with. Elisha left what he was comfortable with in order to step into the call of ministry. What are you familiar with? What are you comfortable with that you can't leave? Do you think Christ was comfortable when he had nails in his hands? Do you think Christ was comfortable when he had thorns on his head? Do you think Christ was comfortable when he was raised up on a cross? No. So who do you think you are that you're supposed to be comfortable in this walk? Amen? So we talk about the mantle and how the mantle was placed on, on Elisha. And Elisha said, let me, let me go back and, and kiss my brothers and kiss my father and kiss my mother. And Elijah didn't say anything. He recognized and he kept walking. So Elisha, he left and he went back home. The scripture says that he threw a big feast for his family. Because he recognized the calling on my life is more important. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my goodbyes now. He made a feast, and then he left. He went right, he went right after Elijah. Right? I want to remind you that Elisha is the son of a wealthy man. The next time in scripture we hear about Elijah in 2 Kings 3.11. And this scripture is talking about Elisha pouring hands, pouring water, excuse me, on the hands of the man of God, Elijah. Servitude. We're on the third point of servitude. The Lord says, I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to serve. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Elisha was the son of somebody wealthy. And what was he doing? He was pouring water on Elijah's hands. Now, in that day, customary in that day, that's similar to like a king having like a servant pouring water or or drying their hands. Who are you submitted to? Who are you under? What is your, what is, we have to have an awareness to authority. As a characteristic of a believer, you guys, we have to be productive. We have to count the cost. You have to be wise. You have to realize that in this walk, you can't do anything or everything that you may want to do. You may want to go out and hang out with your friends or, or go see your family, but the Lord may be calling you for a time of consecration where you have to, 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 to shut in for a couple of hours. The Lord may be calling you for a time of study. The Lord may be calling you for a time of prayer, for a time of mission, for a time of outreach, and you have to be prepared for that. Because he's saying, hey, you have, to, you have to recognize that in this walk, it's about other people. It's not about yourself. Right. So you are building yourself up for somebody else. And, and I'll, I'll briefly share this with you. Four years ago, I watched my father die. And, and I watched at 23 years old, I watched my father pass away in front of me. And um, mm, it was something I couldn't even wish on my enemy. It was the hardest thing that I've had to deal with. And I still have my moments four years later, but let me tell you, out of that, because I, I was a mess. And I can be honest with you guys. Four years ago, after my father passed away, I was a mess. I was a mess. And then four years later, I had people that were in my circumference at that time. And they said, Koi, um, my dad died. Can you help me? Um, Koi, I'm dealing with loss. Can you help me? At that time, I didn't understand why the Lord would do that. Why would you take away my father? Why would you take somebody, the, only, the first man that I loved, why would you take him away? But then I recognize that this walk isn't for me. He built me up to help somebody else. So now I can counsel somebody who's dealing with loss. I can give them wisdom. I can say, hey, look, I understand where where you've been. And let, let me tell you how the Lord delivered me, how the Lord cleaned me up. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. And that's what we are to be. We are to revive the lost. We are to revive the depleted. We are to revive and give, give hope to people who feel like there is no hope. We cannot allow our gift to take us somewhere that our character cannot sustain us. 
So we have to get our character in order. The characteristic of a believer, you have to be productive. If the Lord hasn't promoted you yet, check your heart. Check yourself. Check your motives. We always want that promotion. But sometimes the Lord will give you humble tasks before the great promotion. Before Elisha was parting the water. Before Elisha was, was allowing steel or metal to float. He was pouring hands on a man of God. He was called to be a servant. We are called to be a servant first. How do you expect to be great in the kingdom of God if you can't serve? What did Jesus do? Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. I mean, we could put it in a whole other perspective. Jesus washed the feet of those that he created. I mean, what? And you mean to tell me that you can't hug somebody who's homeless? You mean to tell me you can't shake a hand to somebody who may not have their hands clean? You mean to tell me that you have standards about, oh, 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 they, they don't smell the greatest. I can't hug them or I can't, I can't put them in my car because, you know, I just got my car cleaned and, and I don't want that on my seats. <laughs> I mean, we laugh, but that's how the body of Christ is. Yes. I was at school the other, on Saturday, yesterday, and I had one of my professors tell me a story. And it was one of the most disheartening stories. Because he said he was doing this, a revival, and two ladies that lived in L.A. wanted to be a part of the revival. And so he called one of his pastors that lived in L.A. and he said, hey, can you, uh, can you pick up these ladies down, they live right by you and bring them up to the revival. Uh, they really want to go, they just don't have a car. And he said, uh, well, you know, I just got my car clean. This is a brand new car. They're going to indent my seats. What? What? They want to hear the word of God. And you're worried about whether your car will be okay after they leave? Let's talk about a, a, a condition of your heart. Amen? Amen? As a believer, we are commissioned to shine light in darkness. As a believer, we are commissioned to do those things that we may not want to do. As, as a believer, we are commissioned to be all things to all men. Amen. These are the simple commissions of a believer. The simple characteristics, excuse me, of a believer. Nothing can sway that. You should be so grounded and rooted in your faith. Nothing can sway that. I know I came to serve, sis, so what do you need me to do? How, how can I help you, brother? When the body of Christ can live like that, we'll see unity. Amen? Amen. My last closing point is, is focusing on Who we are. Who we are in the body of Christ. We're servants. First. First. Amen? I really want you to study the life of Elisha because it's amazing. Because the Bible says that when the dead man hit the bones of Elisha, that he arose. But the Bible doesn't say, the Bible doesn't make a distinction that this dead man was a believer or not. All the Bible says that when this dead man came into contact with Elisha, that he arose to a higher level. It doesn't matter who comes in your contact. It doesn't matter who walks across your path. They should not leave the same way that they came. There should be a kum, which means a higher sense of arising. That means that they should not be the same. That you've imparted something in them that they can impart to somebody else. What are you giving the people? Because we're commissioned to be lights. Amen? Amen. So I want to thank you for the time that you've given me to teach the word of God. And I thank you for pastor, the deacon, and the clergy for allowing me time to teach. Amen? So I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, pastor. Let's give the Lord another praise offering for the message and the messenger. What time did you say you coming on TBN again? 
The Bible says train up a child in the way that they should go. I think we should give uh, the, uh, the youth a round of applause.